All right, thank you so much, everybody. I'm, um, as Dr. Hardy mentioned, I'm Aiden Iacchini. I'm an associate professor in the College of Social Work. We're excited to have everyone here today. Um, and our topic is using illustrations as a teaching tool to explore biases. We also want to acknowledge this work is done in collaboration with some of our colleagues who aren't here today, Dr. Melissa Reitmeyer and Dr. Brown as well. And so kind of our learning objectives um, are twofold. One, we want to uh, describe to you all and share with you a little bit about what we view as kind of the value of illustrations as a teaching and learning tool. And then we also want to offer you an example of, um, we're going to let you sort of try this out in practice, and then also thinking about how this type of tool could be used within your own course. So we're hoping by the end of this time together, these 30 minutes, you'll be able to do both of those things. So I'm now I'm going to turn it over to Tash, and she's going to start talking to you a little bit about the use of illustrations. Hi. So illustrative methods um, can be anything from pictures, drawings, images, and any other types of visuals. Um, they can be taken, you know, with a camera or created by the student. Um, and they provide insight to beliefs and perceptions that we might not see in traditional methods, such as writing and oral presentations. And this is really useful in helping uncover some of the implicit biases that students might hold. And those implicit biases are unconscious or subconscious beliefs and attitudes people have. So they might not realize that they're actually present, but this is a way of eliciting some of those beliefs. So as Ada mentioned, we want you to just take a minute to quickly, if you're able to, sketch out or um, imagine what you might draw if you don't have a pencil and paper ready, but draw the role of a social worker. So some of you might be more familiar or less familiar, but just what pops into your head, take just a minute to sketch something out and then write a short sentence about the drawing. And we'll give you just about a minute to do this and then we'll come back to it later. Okay, so while you guys are doing that, I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit about what we did with our class. So our class exercise included 26 Masters of Social Work students um, in a rural and interprofessional behavioral health field seminar. So these are our second year advanced students. Um, and prior to the start of any class content, students were asked to draw with a pencil and paper, similar to what we just asked. And they were given about 10 minutes to respond and asked to write a brief sentence about their picture. And we asked them to draw a social worker's role on an interprofessional team. And what we found were a variety of responses. Some were extremely detailed. The positions of the social worker were different in different images. So I'm gonna go through a few different examples of some of the common illustrations that we found with the students. So one was of the team, an interprofessional team, which makes sense given the prompt. But what we looked at were some of the subtleties within the drawing. So you see the social workers at the center, they're really leading the team there. You can see all of the roles they've labeled the social worker as. Um, we've got these arrows showing communication and many of the professionals are labeled, but they're all non-gendered and have these little instant of facial features, the question marks. Um, another one we saw I'm tapping over like we have an actual presentation. Let me click it. There we go. Uh, was in health settings. And so this might have been from, these are second year students, so their first year placement might have influenced some of their thinking, um, but some of them were depicted in a medical setting. So this one is in a patient's room. It's highly detailed. You have the social worker sort of outside of the team and all of the people have genders represented. And one of the things that about half of our students drew were the clients actually involved in this interprofessional team. So you have the patient or the client there at the center of the picture. Um, and a variety, again, of professionals, mostly medical, which makes sense given the, the setting they drew. And so on the next one here, we have kind of in contrast to the interprofessional team, they just drew a single social worker and really articulated more so the roles that that social worker might hold on the team. So being the middleman, a team player, the mediator between professionals, and they did represent the gender, and that might have been the gender of the student who decided to drew this. And I'll just take a second too to touch on like the written description there just describes 
the social worker on and in a professional team being all these things listed above at once. So giving us a little more context about what they were meaning with all the labels. And then as we go, so what we learned from these images, like we said, those are just a snapshot. We had 26 different images from these students, a variety of different settings, um, but mostly they demonstrated what the social worker's role is, which is good because that was what we asked them to do. And we found that they often discussed the social worker being either the glue or sort of the hub, that key part of the interprofessional team, and also bringing a unique viewpoint, mostly situated towards considering what the client or patient's best interest was, articulating that to the team, um, and then getting the clients and families resources, so being that person, that go-between. And then what we also found in the illustrations, which did not come out in their descriptions, was who was involved in the team. So as you saw in those quick examples, a lot of the professionals were medical professionals, so doctors and nurses and health-related professionals were among the top illustrated, but we also had students who illustrated a school setting and had principal, assistant principal, the teacher, a couple different counselors on the team. So it really gave us a sense of who they saw on the interprofessional teams that they worked with or what they imagined interprofessional teams were. And then the last thing we found was how they were really illustrating how the teams work together. So frequently we saw that first example of the team meeting happening, a formal team meeting with different professionals. Maybe there were some eras illustrating the communication happening between often the social worker was at the head of the team meeting or the doctor. Um, which makes sense sort of given some of the different professional hierarchies we see today. Um, but it didn't, what we didn't see um, appear in these were some of the informal learning and working opportunities that happen within a professional team setting. So often it was just that central team meeting and not individuals, um, individual professionals working with the social workers individually at different points and coming together. And so, if you think back to just if you're able to what we asked you guys to draw so who did you we'll just get through these one at a time so who did you draw as a social worker and think a little bit about why you drew that person as a social worker so i see dr hardy you you already put something in the chat box about your drawing you said i think it's interesting that as a non-social worker i drew a person going around to homes and with a lot of paperwork and I see your question around media representation so you're thinking that maybe that influenced what you drew yes that true? <laughs> yeah I think it is really interesting because if you think about the prompt right it's really broad like draw draw the role of a social worker in our class we said draw the role of a social worker on an interprofessional team and you can see how um, if you ask somebody that and what they draw, it's very different, right? And sometimes we, we don't recognize our implicit biases until we're, we draw them and then we reflect on, well, why did I draw the social worker going out to a home, right? What, may, what made me think about that? What experience have I had with the social worker who I've learned about through media or other sources that sort of influenced my thinking? Um, one of the things we were also interested in, you know, in gender, you know, a lot of times uh, folks uh, stereotype of the profession as social workers are female. Um, and so we were also, one of the things we started exploring in the data is sort of, are the students drawing social workers and are they only female? Are they non-gendered? Are they male? Um, so you can see the ways that the drawing itself if you ask someone draw the role of a social worker, they're not going to say, I'm drawing, I have a, there's a female social worker going to do X, Y, and Z. But if you have them draw it, you can see how that sort of comes out. Have any of you all used drawings before in um, any of the classes you teach? I see, uh, said I added a smile too. Notice that was on some of the images. That was something we actually started coding for. Some um, images did have sort of facial expressions and some um, had, you know, no eyes, no mouth, right? No, de no level of detail like that. Okay, I see others saying I, you were thinking of someone in your family, right, who's studying to be a social worker and how that influences 
um, what you may have drawn. So I see, Dr. Hardy, you said you you've used drawings before, I think, and then seeing you've not. So we sort of have the range in here. I think it's interesting, you know, when, when Tash and I were putting this presentation together, not sure who in the audience, you know, where you all would be from in terms of discipline. You know, you think about if you had somebody, we, at our first we were thinking about having you all sort of draw your family, right? And like sort of what would, you know, draw your family then, and see what you drew as the, as the image of your family. And, and I think if we had the opportunity to visually see all of them, we would know how different they would be. And we found that part of the value in having folks put the drawing on paper and write some text around it is then the reflective piece of why did I draw what I did without even really thinking about it? Or like, why did I draw the social worker going to someone's house? Why did I draw the social worker as a female? Why did I draw social workers' roles on interprofessional teams as, you know, working with a client? Like, where did that knowledge sort of come from or why do I believe that to be true and I think that reflective piece of the exercise is also something um, that is important to consider. Uh, I will say one thing we tried to do and it might be something that um, is helpful and you know your all's teaching and work is also thinking about you know, pre-post drawings, right? Our classes are designed to teach some type of content and um, thinking about pre and post. We tried to do that with this particular exercise, but um, COVID happened and it influenced the drawings in lots of different ways, partially because the timing of the post drawings was like one week, like after school closed down in March. So, um, from a research perspective, that's not very helpful. But we can use this, and we are using this virtually right now with another cohort of MSW students where they're drawing their images, taking a picture of them, and then uploading them as JPEGs, and then that's sparking kind of the conversation in the classroom. So something to think about in this virtual world we all find ourselves in, too. Would anybody be willing to share, you know, has this prompted your thinking in relationship to your own teaching and how you might use this? I see Dr. Hardy, you're saying it'd be interesting to have your students draw a process like pattern in marine science before we talk about it to address misconceptions. I do think that that, yes, I think there's great utility in using this as a quick, you know, this only takes, you know, we gave our students 10 minutes, but it's brief, right? something you could do on the first day of class, get the students engaged, but it also provides you like a ton of contextual information about your students and how they think um, and who, you know, who they are, what knowledge they come to class with that I really think as an instructor can help you sort of tailor, right, your instructional strategies and your content accordingly. So that is one way that we we think that this can be helpful. I see that you had, you tried to use them, but some students had difficulty, difficulty in terms of uh, just doing the drawings or difficulty in terms of like what it was bringing up for them through the drawings. Oh, they didn't want to stop drawing. <laughs> they got so excited about the experience. Okay. Well, that's, I, I guess I would argue that's probably a good problem to have them drawing more than less, but yeah you're agreeing about identifying misconceptions before the topic. Yeah, I think that, you know, to get back to what you were saying, I think, you know, putting uh, time limited restrictions on it ahead of time, you know, saying you have 10 minutes and we really stuck to those 10 minutes because we have to do a lot of other things. It's a grant funded project. So we have to do lots of other things in that class. But those, you know, that 10 minute sort of structured time, I think also gives the student just sort of a frame of reference, like I don't have a ton of time to draw. This is what I'm able to do kind of within that window. The nice thing too is if you do the drawings and then you do kind of like a two sentence description of what students um, drew, you also then can see what they write about versus what they're drawing. And we found that a lot more comes out in the drawings than it does in their actual writing. Because I'll say in the past, I use things around like reflection journals and, you know, questions, you know, what do you think about X, Y, and Z? And what people will write and orally say is very different than what they'll draw. And so it's just another kind of uh, 
I think, important data indicator as an instructor. Yeah, a couple of, well, Aiden already mentioned that the gender came out, but something else that wasn't in any of their descriptions, so had we just asked them, you know, to write a couple sentences, almost none of the students labeled any sort of professionals that were working in their team in their description. The, that was only seen in the images where they were labeling or had people, you know, and represented them with different symbols like a stethoscope for doctors and some of those common um, representations. But without the illustrations, we wouldn't have known who they were sort of um, envisioning on these interprofessional teams. Yeah, that's a great point. And I see, Jennifer, you're saying here that, it, that this tool could also be used to help us understand um, some of our own biases, right? And I definitely agree with that. Because you're right that the students may have um, more diverse perspectives than we do. I also think, you know, from a teaching and learning perspective, have students, you know, you could even think about doing this where students do these drawing individually, come together in small groups, right, to discuss what they drew, what was similar, what was different, and why. Um, it's a great point of conversation and learning, not only from, um, not, learn, not only learning more about themselves, right, but learning more about each other and the way each other thinks and using that as kind of a teaching tool as well. I always find it so hard in this virtual environment to kind of get a read on the audience. And I think, you know, Tasha and I, we're, we're planning to try to have more conversation and less of us talking at, but we're happy to talk through, you know, the, the other content um, that we've learned about. Dr. Hardy, I see you saying, did you find students hesitant to draw because they can't draw? No, we did not find that to be, to be an issue. Um, not to say that that maybe couldn't come up, right? And um, if, but I don't even, I don't think that happened again this year because we've already done the drawings for this year. Uh, that was like in the begin, the end of August, and I don't think we found that. I don't know. In some ways, I think the student. Oh, go ahead. It, they seemed like they were highly detailed, and I think a lot of people, given the instructions, like we weren't looking for a masterpiece here. It was like made acceptable that you can draw stick figures, you can draw however you want. And like you said, the individual one where they really only drew one person and then they used a lot of descriptors around, I think that's what we saw in students who didn't quite want to draw maybe a whole you know, team or things like that, didn't feel confident in their skills. But that could be something to, to add later on too. We can ask them afterwards, like how comfortable were you drawing versus writing about, you know, what we asked? Yeah. And I think for those of you kind of in the, you know, health sciences area, the, you know, thinking about you have to be health sciences, right? It could be any, you know, really any area where you're collaborating with other folks, getting people to draw you know, what they believe other disciplines do or how they're involved with a specific knowledge or content or social problem or, you know, scientific question. I think it, you know, again, it can just sort of help uncover these biases that do not come out in either oral discussion or writing. And I almost wonder if students don't, aren't hesitant to draw because I think it's just a more engaging, I think they're just not having that in like graduate level classes, like drawing things, at least not in social work anyway. Um, I would say most of our students are not drawing anything. And so I think, you know, just the uniqueness of that activity kind of brings out, um, I think the creativity in the students as well. 